Hey, it's Monday night, and time for voiceover body shop. George, you're not here. No, I'm virtually guesting tonight. How's everybody going? <laughs> well, we've got a great show tonight. We've got Dr. Rena Gupta, who is an laryngologist. We'll forget the Rhino Odo part of that and just say laryngologist. We're going to talk about vocal health. So if you got lots of questions on that, stay tuned for that. You've got lots of tech updates, right? Yes, we do. We've got a whole bunch of gear to talk about. Some of it's very simple things that are going to make your life a lot better. All right. That's all coming up on VoiceOver Body Shop right now. Two men, twin sons from different mothers, with a passion for voiceover recording technology and the desire to make recording easy for voice actors everywhere. Together in one place. George Whittem, the home studio engineer to the stars, a Virginia Tech grad with an unmatched knowledge of all the latest gear and technology in voiceover today. Dan Leonard, the home studio master, a voice actor with over 30 years experience in broadcasting and recording, and a no-holds-barred, myth-busting attitude for teaching you how easy it is. Together, to bring you all the latest technology, today's voiceover superstars, and leading the discussion on how to make the most of your voiceover business. This is VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, makers of Source Connect, Source Connect Pro and Source Connect Now, VO2Gogo.com, everything you need to become a successful voice artist, VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. The VO Dojo. Take your voiceover career all the way. J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters. And by VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voice actor website shouldn't be a pain in the butt. And now, live from their super secret multimedia studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are George Whittem and Dan Leonard. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or V-O-B-S. All right. Well, another Monday night, and you're here with us. And, of course, we have a, an, a laryngologist with us tonight. And what do I have? I have a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, how the heck did you plan that? I, you know, I was walking around looking for bacteria. Let's see. Yeah, let's try some of that and see if that'll work. You don't have to look far, uh, living where you are with the dogs and everything else. Yeah, it's it, it can be that way. Anyway, our guest tonight is Dr. Rena Gupta from Osborne Head and Neck Institute here in Los Angeles. And uh, we're going to talk about vocal health, and I'm sure you have lots of questions. And, of course, if you have any tech questions for George or I, or both of us at the same time, um, put them in the chat room, because Matt is running the chat room tonight, and uh, he will relay those questions to us, and we really would love to hear some of your tech problems, because that's why George and I are here. And uh, But, you know, it's been an interesting week here in, in La La Land. Now, you're in Boulder. How's the weather in Boulder? Is it snowing or something? Oh, it is snowing. If I could only show you what it looks like. I'm taking a peek. Okay. It's, it looks like uh, God is taking a powdered sugar shaker and dumping it all over the, uh, the yard out there. It looks, it looks beautiful. I miss it not. <laughs> I don't miss my snowblower or any of those things. Well, I had an interesting week because I got to do a big national spot for once and hang out in a really nice studio and work with a real professional crew, and it was fun. And like we always say, you know, because we talk to so many voice professionals on this show, um, how is it, you know, how do you, how do you get that break? And it's like, well, when the opportunity comes, you got to deliver. And fortunately, I got cast in something that actually works for me. So, of course, I can't talk about it. But uh, the usual, right? <laughs> yeah. But you know, well, they say luck favors the prepared. Yeah, so. exactly. Or as my father-in-law used to say, the harder you work, the luckier you get. I like all those sayings. They, they all, all, they all work. 
and, and then yeah, and then I ended up in a celebrity's closet, but I I, I can't really talk about that. Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, yeah, let's we'll just say it's a tech story. Anyway, we don't have news tonight because John Florian's on vacation somewhere, and you know what are you going to do? But you have lots of tech updates, so why don't you lead off with that, Mister Widom? Yeah, I've just been combing the web for some stuff. Some of these things I already knew about, and some of them I've just discovered recently. So, you know, I'll go through it. I, I've got a few links in there, and uh, hopefully Susan might be able to grab some of these and show you what I'm looking at as we, as we go here. But um, working standing, something we've talked about for a long time. I have a standing desk at home, but it's really a desk that's fixed at a standing height. It's something from Ikea. The legs, while they are adjustable, are you have to set them once and be done with it. You can't adjust them on the fly. They'd be a real, it'd be a nightmare to try to lower the desk. So there's been a lot of products coming out, like the Vary desks and all this kind of thing. But this company I found, the price keeps coming down into the, into the affordable office furniture realm. And this particular desk crosses the $99 barrier. Wow. So if you've been thinking of getting a standing desk, but the pricing was just too much or they're too large or too bulky, this one's pretty sweet. It 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 will. Um, it's just it's a desk desk of its own. It's not something you stand on top of your desk because there's a lot of those out there as well. And for ninety nine bucks, it's got uh, basically it works basically like your basic office chair with the hydraulic lever that lets you raise and lower. Um, but the two it has two legs, and each of those two legs are controlled by a single lever on one side. So when you squeeze the lever. The desk comes up. If you want to lower it again, you just have to squeeze the lever and then push back down. Simple, elegant. And it's something that's not very bulky, so it should be able to fit in most, most small booths. You know, I, I think it could fit in everything but the teeniest whisper room or, or maybe the smallest walk-in closet. But um, a really cool way to, to have your computer at the right height and be able to sit down for those long narrations. Um, the model number, if you're looking for it, is the Tangula, T-A-N-G-K-U-L-A, -A, computer desk, sit stand workstation. It's a notebook or notebook stand with wheels. Yeah, I, and, I will attest to the using a standing desk because I was having all sorts of back problems until I decided to stand up and do my work. You know, until I get tired, I just grab a chair and I just sit down there and look up at it. Which is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, of course, get a, get a high stool Yep. Um, for those times you need to take a break. And um, if you look around, you'll actually find some interesting stools that are like not fully just for sitting, but actually for leaning. Leaning, absolutely. Yeah, and that's an interesting compromise because you're not plopped down. You're not going to slouch. It's almost impossible to slouch when you're leaning on a leaning stool. It forces you to have a good posture. Yeah. So yeah. might be something to give a try. I, so. I, I, I attest it works great. Works great. Now, here's something else that is far less expensive, but really, really practical. At this point, you're probably in the minority if you haven't heard of command strips. I'm, I'm, an, I, I'm a minority. Wow. Have you used command strips? Probably not. So what's a command strip? It's, it's basically, it's a fancy Velcro strip. It's made by 3M, though. So it's not Velcro because they don't own that, that trademark, um, but it's a hook and loop or hook fastener. Now, I've known about command strips for a long time, but it wasn't until recently that they became really, really useful. And now I know why. Um, if you have to hang acoustical panels like RLX foam or even the much heavier panels from like ATS Acoustics, something made out of wood, these things will actually be able to hold the weight of your acoustic panels. Um, if you get the heavy duty ones, four two inch long strips can hold 16 pounds of weight. Wow. So a large picture, a mirror or whatever, these can do it. But what's cool about this, what makes them different from regular hook and loop fasteners, if you've ever had to remove those hook and loop fasteners from your painted walls, you know the deal. Paint comes right off. It's a, it's a train wreck. It's really a mess. And if you're renting, it's a bad, bad situation. So the command strips have a really interesting function and that feature 
and that is behind the adhesive is like this piece of elasticy elasticy foam yeah you and pull on it it removes it yeah when you pull there's a little tab and when you pull it it releases the adhesive it sounds so simple but it's a brilliant brilliant solution oh and those command strips those command <laughs> strips. Those command strips. Okay. Yeah, those command strips. Yeah. So they're they're uh, really handy, and if you have to hang anything temporarily, I highly recommend them. I used them um, at, in Joe Cipriano's studio last week. He's in an apartment for a while, and he needs to have. We put acoustical panels all over the inside of a closet, including the inside of the closet doors, but just angled in about a thirty degree angle, so he gets to stand inside and. Have a mostly enclosed space. We're all having fun in celebrities' closets this week. It's great, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so we used I used uh, the command strips on the panels, but the thing is, for extra security, don't just stick the command strip on the panel or on the foam. With something really heavy like the wood panels, I actually staple gunned with two staples the command strips to the back of the panels. Um, you can see a time lapse video of me doing this on my Facebook page. George the Tech, you'll see a, a little Facebook, <laughs> a little time lapse of me stapling and hanging these things on the closet doors, but really, really handy. Um, going down the list, something that I just heard about for the very first time is the Focusrite RedNet X2P 2X2 Ethernet Audio Digital Interface with mic preamps. In that's case you were wondering. For, that's fancy for an audio interface that works over your network. Ah, why is that interesting? It's, it's interesting simply. It's well, it's it can be. It it really actually it's designed to be wired. It uses something called Dante, and Dante is just sort of a, a, a trademarked name, kind of like NDI, which Dan and I are familiar with for sending video around the studio. Dante lets you send multi-track audio around a network. Oh, so, so the the Great interface for musicians then. Musicians, I mean, if you have a, a studio where your interface is in your booth, but the computer is a, di a good distance away, if it's more than six feet away or 10 feet away, running USB or Thunderbolt cables really far distances is a, is a problem. It does not work well at all. It's not reliable. So this using Dante, which is an Ethernet connection, Cat5 cable that goes between the interface and your network, this unit can be placed, you know, just about anywhere there's an ethernet connection. So it's just something new out there, something to try if you're having trouble with stability, finding um, USB or Thunderbolt stuff to be unreliable. It's just something new out there. I haven't demoed it yet, but one of these days I'll get my hands on it. Another thing just stumbled on, and this seems maybe a little more practical, is the Zoom F1 dash sp there it is right there no there <laughs> uh, <laughs> um 250 you're getting a shotgun mic and a recorder in one so it's it's a, a little tiny field recorder it's hard to tell from that picture but it's only about this big and then it uses the modular microphone system that zoom created to work with the h5n and the h6 recorders and they sell as a bundle. So you can get the shotgun mic with this little recorder attached to it for 250 bucks. Why would you want this? Why would you want one of those? You know, if you find that re recording on the road using mic port pros and devices like that are frustrating because maybe you can't get it to interface with your iPhone properly or an iPad or the reliability factor, again, relying on USB, is something that you're not too keen on. This is an all-in-one standalone recording device. So you set it up where you want it, hit record, and it's recording on its own. When you're done, you pop out the memory card or you plug it USB into your Mac or PC and you copy the files over. So it's just a different concept on, on, on remote recording and field recording. And I don't know, for $250, I was really impressed with the price point and Zoom has been hitting it out of the park lately. Their, their quality has really improved. Really? That's really cool. Yeah. Well, tell you what, why don't we take a break and cover a, a bit more of these in, uh, in just a minute. And Dr. Rena Gupta will be with us in a few minutes as well, and we'll talk about your vocal health. So stay tuned. We'll be right back here on VoiceOver Body Shop.
Michael Kostroff. You know him. You just don't know how you know him. Well, there he is. He's that kind of actor. Been everywhere and knows a thing or two about book and work. And that means he knows more than a thing or two about auditioning. Now, Michael is coming to L.A. to record his amazing breakthrough workshop, Audition Psychology 101. It's going to change how you approach your work. It'll change how you audition. It'll change your performer life. You want to change your performer life? Then attend Audition Psychology 101 live in L.A. David H. Lawrence the 17th and VO2GoGo.com has negotiated for you a 30% discount. So instead of paying $95, which is a bargain by itself, if you visit VO2GoGo.com forward slash Michael, you'll attend for just $65. That's VO2GoGo.com forward slash Michael to attend the most amazing auditioning workshop you'll ever attend. VO2GoGo.com forward slash Michael for Audition Psychology 101. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. And we are back on VoiceOver Body Shop. We're talking tech right now. We're going to talk about vocal health, which is, you know, medical stuff in just a little while. So stay tuned for that. Um, but i got to remind you that George and I are here for a reason. And that reason is to make sure that your home voiceover studio is sounding the way it's supposed to sound. And uh, every studio is different. Every room is different. Every voice is different. Every voice is different with different microphones. And there's only two guys on the face of God's green earth that actually understand this who have worked on more home studios than anybody else out there. They may talk about it, but they haven't done it. And, uh, George, if they want to talk to you and uh, have you look over their situation or start from scratch, how do they do that? Well, they head on over to georgethetech.com. That's my home on the web for all the services I provide. And you can book me for a 30-minute phone consult or we can work over Skype. We could also do virtual engineering when you send me your audio and I send back the resulting files, presets, video tutorials, whatever it is that you need, um, all right there at georgethetech.com. And Dan... You do cool stuff with people's audio too. I will figure out which way to point one of these it's, days. It's down, it's down here. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You <laughs> How can, do they find you on the web? Well, they can find me at homevoiceoverstudio.com and uh, or dan at danleonard.com. Got all these websites. What am I going to do with them all? Uh, and I and I do a lot of the same stuff. Uh, I love working with beginners who don't know what a VU meter is and uh, get you from not knowing anything to being competent in a very short period of time. And uh, and if you have a studio set up and you want me to listen to some of your audio, if you go to my website, homevoiceoverstudio.com, at the bottom of the homepage is the Specimen Collection Cup. Click on that, and that will give you the opportunity to send me a specimen of your audio, and I'll be able to tell the size of the room and all those sorts of things. So do that. I've been getting a lot more of those lately, and some of them are really interesting. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, you remember right. when we did bad audio of the week? I you know, it's about seven years ago. Yeah, it's kind of hard to get people to convince people to to send in their audio for that, but that was a fun segment. I wonder if we can revisit that someday. I think that's not a bad idea. <laughs> bad audio of the week because boy, yeah. we with we get a lot more than we used to, so maybe we have more choices. Maybe we anyway. just have to get people to volunteer that uh, their audio for that segment, right? 
So what about uh, you, you were going to talk about this brother printer? Yeah, just one last thing. I mean, some of you still want to read off paper. And I totally understand why. I mean, it's it's more natural, very, very easy to mark things up. I just, I totally get it. But some of you out there are probably still using inkjet printers to print out your scripts. And that is a waste of money. Um, it's just crazy expensive to maintain your inkjet printer. The cartridges are ridiculous. If you look online, you can find inkjet costs, uh, the ink in an inkjet cart cartridge, cartridge at, at I think it costs about $4,000 a gallon. It's the most valuable liquid on the planet, I think. Um, so maybe try something different. And that, I just set up for Maxine here in her home studio, a new brother printer, the ehl l 2320 d rolls off the tongue. They have a whole range of totally black and white network connected printers. This one has USB and it also has Ethernet. And I love the Ethernet connection because once it's connected to your home's network, anybody that can connect to the network can print to the printer. And the beauty of it is it uses toner cartridges. And toner cartridges can print, I mean, the printer, the cartridges that this thing came with can print 2,600 pages mm. on average. Wow. That's, before, like, so that's before it starts to say low toner. Right, exactly, <laughs> and that's that's five plus reams of paper. Wow! So, but what's really amazing is a toner cartridge is like fifty bucks. If you ever went out and bought four or five packs of ink for your inkjet, it was probably about forty or fifty bucks. So you get way more pages to print. Yes, it's black and white. So if you really need to print color, you need another printer for that, or go to Kinkos or whatever. But most of you will probably find that you rarely print color. So it's pretty sweet. Right now, you can find one of these refurbished on Amazon Prime for 75 bucks. It's really incredibly good value. Wow, that's cool. So if you're cool. really tired of your inkjet printer, um, this might be something to give a try. Very cool. Now, I'm not sure whose studio we're in tonight. Uh, it looks like we're in somebody's closet, and I think we actually <laughs> are. Uh, so whoever you are, if you're watching, let us know who you are, because I look through, I'm like, who sent us this picture? But uh, yeah, always put your name in the file. It, it helps. Just, it does. It, it does. Really helps. Yeah, but it's but, cool. It's very. It looks like a totally practical but well treated studio. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, and well lit and and that sort of thing. Well, we have a tech question though. All right. We do from Joy Baker. She says, "I'm switching from using a Centrance Micport Pro to a Scarlett eight one eight uh, eighteen i eight. That's, that's a lot of that's a lot of inputs." Uh, my computer refuses to share both the input and the output with my digital audio workstation, which happens to be Reaper, and a website, Skype or webinar site, at the same time. How do I solve that? I've tried all the sound card settings I can think of. Boy, that's a, that's a that's a big one. Well, I got. I mean, I got to ask the first question: Why the eighteen i eight? Are you recording? eight microphones at once time because that, that that is a fantastic piece of gear but it, it was it's for doing large productions where you can record a band or uh, an ensemble or something so that said i'm not going to rant on but it's <laughs> it's overkill <laughs> definitely overkill um, but that said maybe you are doing some music it you're probably on windows that's my best possible guess you conveniently left that detail out and so if you're watching the show and you're in the chat room, please tell us whether you're on Mac or Windows. Because um, these, kind of, these kinds of issues are really a, totally non-issues on the Mac. Yeah, everything sound is plug and play on a Mac. You plug it in and it works. Pretty much. I mean, the sound drivers are really solid and devices can be shared between different applications and they all work together in harmony very, very well. On the Windows side, there are more than one set of drivers. There's like the Windows Classic Wave Driver, and uh, I'm trying to think of some others right off the top of my head, but there are a lot of different kinds of drivers. But there's also what's called the ASIO or ASIO driver. All right, we have an answer here. She should have said Windows. Good call. 
You know, gotcha. And, so she's using it for you know more than voiceover. She's yes, doing yes. worship team stuff. So right. She, she says she, she bought it for the church worship team. Gotcha. So okay, makes lots sense. of inputs. The choir, reverend. Exactly. So you can do multi-track recordings now from from the church worship team. Um, so the problem is, is if you're using likely the ASIO driver, and she might even be able to confirm this in the in the chat as she did the last question I had. Um, the ASIO driver may not allow the audio hardware to be shared with other things outside of Reaper. So if Reaper is set to use that audio interface under the ASIO driver, I don't think it's going to play nicely with anything else. Now, that said, some ASIO drivers will allow that device to be shared. And there are settings in there that say whether the device can be used, another application or something can take over the use of the device or not. So if that's the case for you, um, you may want to not use the ASIO driver and use something else like the Windows Classic uh, Wave driver. Is that going to result in better stability or better reliability? I don't know. <laughs> ASIO is usually, usually the most stable driver. But the reason why ASIO is such a big deal is because of latency. So when you're using ASIO, if you have to listen to something and sing along with it, doing multi-track recording where you have to sing along with the track, that latency matters, matters a lot. If you're only doing live recording, a voiceover track or a bunch of microphones, the latency is a non-issue. You don't care about any delay that the computer imparts while recording. It's not a problem. So if that's the case for you, try a different driver. Try a Windows Classic Rave driver. Um, and she actually responded. This is so interactive tonight. Um, she has the ASIO driver, but it doesn't always work well. Sometimes I have to do wave out or direct something. Um, yes, yeah, so you're finding out the stability issues you may have with Windows 10 and multitasking. Windows 10 with audio stuff just doesn't multitask very well. Just doesn't. So I may recommend to you, if you're looking for absolute reliability, have a second computer, another Windows laptop or whatever that you're using for auxil auxiliary stuff, playing back websites, playing back audio from iTunes, who knows, and pipe that in to an input on your 18i8 so you have a, an independent system because you really want that system to be locked down, dedicated, and reliable for the purposes of doing live recording. All righty. Is that enough tech for now? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, let's let's break away, and we'll be back with uh, Dr. Rena Gupta, and we'll be talking about vocal health. So stay tuned for that here on VoiceOver Body Shop. We'll be right back. Are you confused about how to set up and maintain a professional quality voiceover studio? No wonder. The information out there is mostly mythology. This is the best microphone to use. You have to have a preamp. You need a soundproof booth. This software is the best. Your audio must be broadcast quality. Consult with someone who knows the truth. Someone who's been there, in the trenches, doing voiceover for over 30 years. Someone with unparalleled experience with voiceover studios, who's worked with hundreds of voice actors and designed hundreds of personal studios. He knows how to teach and cares about your success in one of the harshest environments known to voiceover, your home. Dan Leonard, the home studio master. Separate myth from fact and get a handle on your personal voiceover studio. Contact the home studio master at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Drop off a specimen of your dry audio for a free analysis. Hey everybody, I wanted to tell you about one of our wonderful sponsors, Source Elements. You guys have heard us talking about a lot of different products for them. But tonight, I'm actually going to tell you about something that's totally free. Yes, free. And that is Source Connect Now. Source Connect Now is their audio software that is not software at all. It's actually completely based on the web. And that comes with it pros and cons. Those that have used web-based audio systems like IPDTL and things that run on Chrome are aware that Chrome, the web browser, updates itself whenever the heck it wants to. And when that happens, 
things okay. sometimes break. They don't always, but sometimes they break. So for that reason, it's good to try something that is standalone. And they actually have built at Source Elements a standalone Source Connect now. So if you're using Source Connect now or if you haven't tried it yet, set up your Source Elements account at source-elements.com. And then go to the downloads area and under the categories of software, you'll find there's actually a Source Connect now. You can download and install the standalone version of Source Connect now and start using it just like regular Source Connect now. It connects to anybody else with Source Connect now. You can send out links to have your clients listen in on sessions. It's like the world's best phone patch. Sound quality is amazing. Works on Mac or Windows, works with any audio hardware you got from the Scarlett to i2 to the Universal Audio Apollo and beyond. So go check it out at source-elements.com. And we'll be right back with Dan and Rena back in Los Angeles. All right, we're back. I'd like to introduce our guest, Dr. Rena Gupta, is Director of Voice and Swallowing Center at the Osborne Head and Neck Institute, based out of the Cedar sinai Medical Towers here in Los Angeles, California. Nice address. Uh, Dr. Gupta, Gupta has... De devoted her practice to the care of patients with voice and swallowing problems. She is a board-certified uh, doctor in otolaryngology and laryngology and a fellowship trained in laryngology with a special interest in the care of the professional voice. Let's welcome Dr. Rena Gupta. Welcome to Voice Over Body Thank Shop. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you here. Um, first off... It's always great having a doctor on. And I know a lot of people will probably ask a lot of medical questions and stuff. Yeah. You are a doctor. You haven't, you probably played one on TV too, but, um, but you can't really like without a lot of details and without examining somebody, yeah. it's kind of tough to make, give them an opinion, isn't it? It is. I get that a lot when I do lectures or when I do spots and shows that people ask really insightful questions and they ask questions about how the voice works. And then inevitably we get to the, so I have a da, 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 da. Right. And that's really hard to answer because I, it sounds cagey, but I need an exam. I need more information to be able to make a diagnosis and you want me right. to have all that information. So I will field as many questions as I can. And if we get into that turf, I'll just say, honestly, um, I can't do that without an exam. All right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, most of the time we're talking to voice actors on here mm. and producers and casting directors and stuff like that. And I always ask, how'd you get into voiceover? How did you find yourself in the medical profession? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell you my story, huh? Okay, so first you're going to have to orient me. Where am I supposed to look? Right there. There. There you okay. go. Because, yeah, first timer, yeah? yeah. Um, so I have sang my whole life. I trained in the world of professional voice. More as a hobby, but I really was passionate about it. And what I found is that I was, I knew I was going to go into the medical field, but as I was pursuing medicine, I also continued to answer to the part of me that wanted to sing. Mm -hmm. And so through my medical school choir, I found out about this field of laryngology, which is a subspecialty within ENT, where you are essentially just taking care of the T part, the throat or the larynx. And so kind of answering that calling for wanting to be part of the voice world and medicine and just fortuitously finding that there was a field that married the two led me to this world of professional voice care. And then even within laryngology, theoretically, I could do swallowing, as you mentioned, and airway stuff, but I've even further tapered it down to the professional voice just because that's my, my real passion. It's, it's, I find it fascinating when doctors talk about how the specialty they get into. Yeah. When I was in high school, I had a couple of friends who were going off to college to be podiatrists. Mm. And I'm like, you're going to be a podiatrist. And the answer from both of them, because they were both good friends, was you wouldn't believe how many things can go wrong with somebody's feet. And I'm imagining that something as sophisticated as your vocal uh, vocal folds and all the things connected there there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. Yeah, it's true. It's sort of the through way also. So if you imagine you have these vocal cords that sit in the middle here, but they're subject to whatever you're breathing in and whatever you're digesting and refluxing back up and then use and abuse. And so it's they're small. They're about the size of a thumb, like the width of a thumbnail. But especially because of how 
communicative our society is and how much we rely on voice, you often do find that there's a lot that can go sideways with the voice. Yeah, I don't I know it. You know, all of us have one. So usually something goes wrong one time or another. So I'm in business. Yeah, well, yeah there you go. So I find it fascinating also that a lot of people who end up in, in otolaryngology also are vocalists themselves. Ah, uh, so you've talked to a biased crew. Uh, well, may, yeah. may, maybe. <laughs> well, well, of course, the, my, my last ran an otolaryngologist, the legendary Dr. Joel Bernstein, maybe, maybe you remember him from EWABS a few years ago, was also an opera singer. Mm. And so, yes, you, you've spoken to and been cared for by, um, by a subset, I would say. So within the field of ENT, you're going to get people who take care of all things, right? So that's going to be your otorhinolaryngologist or your ENT. And then a lot of us, especially these days, have chosen to subspecialize because each area has become very advanced in its own right. So while I trained to do everything, all of ENT, I did what we call a fellowship, which is subspecialty training in just laryngology, which is where you get that term laryngologist. Right. But in my practice, for example, we have people who just do ears. So we have otologists, we have facial plastic surgeons, we have head and neck surgeons. So nowadays, I'd say the real cutting edge, most advanced care is going to be provided by people who have subspecialized and truly only do one of the parts of ENT. It's um, probably increasingly common over the past decade so that a lot of the old guard still does everything. Um, and I don't think it's as bad as like jack of all trades, master of none. I'm certainly not. I'm not saying that. But I do feel that by dedicating myself, for example, to just voice, a lot does come out just from seeing 15 voice patients a day that somebody who's seeing two voice patients, two ear patients, a few sinuses, a few allergies, you're not going to get exposed to the same breadth and depth of voice issues mm -hmm. and so i have to believe that with the training as well as with that practical experience that there's more that i can offer to a professional voice user yeah and being here in la you meet a lot of people who use their voice yeah i'm not here by accident <laughs> <laughs> are you from here originally i'm from new york oh okay yeah yeah and there are laryngologists in new york um there's laryngologists in la honestly mm. but when i first came about a decade ago there were none um, there were a lot of ENTs who had a passion for the voice and cared for the voice, but none who truly were subspecialized and trained to care for the voice. And so over these past 10 years, that's been one of my soapbox issues, which is um, you don't have to come to me, but go to a laryngologist, go to somebody who understands the latest and greatest in the world of voice science so that you can get um, the care you need. Yeah. Now we've met a few times at, at a couple of voice conferences and I remember you stick, is, is it an otoscope or what is it they call this, this fiber optic thing you stick yeah. down and you look at your vocal cords and stuff. So every question you ask is incredibly loaded and I don't know if you realize it, but there's, there's a long answer to every question. Okay. Um, the, I'll make it as short as I can, which okay. is to say that time. there's a lot of ways you can look at the larynx and the old way, the classic way, the way that I would say all ENTs do is a fiber optic scope that goes through your nose, and that's what we call fiber optic laryngoscopy, or fiber optic flexible laryngoscopy, because the, the, the tube has to be flexible to go in through your nose. Um, laryngologists will not do that. We will do a what we call a rigid stroboscopy, and that's probably what I'm hoping I did for you, um, equipment you know, permitting. And that's a scope that goes in through your mouth, mm -hmm. and we have a microphone, which is nowhere near what you have here, <laughs> but it syncs to the pitch, the frequency of vibration of the vocal folds, and it starts a strobe light to be just barely out of sync with that, oh. so that you're capturing a different frame on every wave, so that you get this illusion of slow motion, and you can actually see vocal fold vibration, which is incredibly fascinating, and it's just beautiful to watch. But with the flexible scope, the fiber optic that you get in the nose, you can't see that because it's too fast for the right. naked so eye to see. see. Closing so you just see this. Right, right. Exactly. So people will say, well, you don't have nodules, and so you're fine. But you really need to be able to see the vibration to assess function. So it's sort of like the ophthalmologist saying, okay, your eyes look beautiful, and they're probably fine because I don't see anything horrific going on. Yeah, but what about that visual acuity testing? You need to actually look at how they're seeing right. to know how they're functioning. And so that's what I sort of, that's the closest analogy I can come to. Well, that was, that was short and sweet. So you're good. Okay. All right. How does, how does it all work? I mean, 
I mean, I open my mouth every morning and it doesn't sound quite the same as it did the evening before. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's it vibrations and control of air. It's yes. an, an amazing evolutionary thing on our part. It is an incredible instrument. And I love when people appreciate that because it is very sophisticated. It's very delicate. And we do take it for granted because people talk all the time. Oh, I lost my voice. I went out and it'll come back and they kind of keep chugging along. Um, but it is the complex interplay between your breath and the support that you provide to allow vocal fold closure and then vibration, which is a combination of sort of that Bernoulli effect, right? That pressure phenomenon and this acoustic phenomenon that comes back onto your vocal fold. So it's an interplay of below and above. Right. And then the most important part, which is why you sound different than I sound, is our resonance. So it's everything from vocal folds on out to the outside world. Which is your sinuses. Everything, and all the your things. mouth, your right. lips, your teeth, your gums. I mean, everything has a different weight and density to it in you and me. And as we age, that changes. And as, you know, as we use it and shape it for voiceover, it changes. And that's what allows us to sound different from ourselves from day to day and from each other in the world. That's what makes us look different. It's also what makes us sound different. And everybody's voice is totally unique. Like a thumb. Which is why there's so much work for you guys out there. Yes. We're all snowflakes. And you got to, everybody's a little bit in different. In a very apolitical sense, yes. <laughs> yes. In an yes. apolitical yes. sense? Yes. Okay, I won't even go there. What amazes me, like I said, with feet, how many things can go wrong with, you know, with, with your, your vocal cords or with your voice? And yeah. there's, because as you said, there's so many different things that are affecting it. What are some of the prime problems that you see from, from voice actors? Voice actors are prone to one of the most difficult problems because it's not what you have heard, right? Nodules, polyps, things like that. Those are, I find those more in singers, to be honest. What voice actors are prone to is something that can't be detected without stroboscopy which is probably why it's been missed for so many decades. And it's this wear and tear phenomenon that happens. So there's a layer of the vocal folds that's responsible for all of our vibration and all of the sound that we make. And that layer can erode with overuse, misuse, especially we see this with like a lot of the people who have to do a lot of yelling and really aggressive, like pounding the pavement voice use. That layer sort of erodes. And I give the analogy of like the lubrication in your knee joint. It erodes with heavy use and that stuff is irreplaceable. But that's what I see in a lot of really extensive voiceover users is that wear and tear. And that's what introduces a little bit of the raspiness, a little bit of the unevenness of pitch that can happen over time. So I don't see a lot of voiceover users with nodules and polyps and things like that. It typically is this sort of chronic mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I got a cold right now. Okay. Well, don't, don't worry about it. It's... Wasn't your fault. This is true. Um, but how is it that that affects everything? Because I, it's not in your vocal cords, Correct. Yeah. but it it's taking out a number of frequencies in there. Yeah. And so, what exactly is going on? And I mean, I mean, aside from this big empty space here, what's going on? You know, with the vocal cords. And yeah, stuff? that speaks to sort of what we were talking about: how the vocal cords are your throughway. So what will happen is almost every cold virus, almost every illness starts up here, mm -hmm. starts. And that's why everyone, yep, does that. The sniffles, that sort of itchiness in your nose, and you feel it in the back of your nose. I felt it in my ears, too, because I was having balance problems. Yeah. For, oh, well, that's unusual. But yeah. that's probably that same virus happens to be going there as well. But right. typically you'll get it nose and sinus. What happens from that point is if you're not able to kind of arrest it in your nose and there are strategies that you can implement to do that, it will drip. And that's just simple gravity. And that's why we wake up feeling really crummy because all night it's been dripping from our nose into our throat and it just kind of sits on your cords and it drops into your chest. And that's where you get the cough. And that's where you get what we call laryngitis, which is just inflammation of the cords. But when they're swollen, their vibrating frequency changes. So you're used to positioning your cords a certain way and getting a certain frequency of vibration from that positioning. But now that they're heavier, that vibration slows just enough that you get uh, bassy right. and you get that, mm -hmm. yeah? And the way so, I want to sound all the time. Look, yeah. you can't always sound sick, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's where you also get that sort of delicacy, if you will. So you're trying to sing and you'll be pitchy, you'll be flat because they're heavier and what you're used to positioning to execute doesn't get the result that you're looking for anymore because they're weightier. Right. 
So if, if you've got a cold, uh, and, and, and voice actors are always talking about this. Yeah, the remedies. Like, yeah. What, what do you do to, to make yourself sound normal? I find that, you know, you know it's showtime. You just got to sound, just got to be who you are and do what you do best. Yeah. The push through it phenomenon. Yeah. 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 I'm never sick. You know, no. So. Yes. We're not, we're not human. <laughs> I don't get sick either. So, um, the, the key I find is to catch it early and to not pretend you're not sick. Um, so if you can get it to stay in your nose, you're already winning. And so I'm a big fan of the Neil Med, the sinus rinse, you know, the squirt bottles that they have. And you just fill it up with distilled water, throw a little salt packet. I definitely should be a sponsor for them because yeah. I probably sell more than anybody. But I do believe in it. I, I think it really works to stop it from dripping into your throat. And I'll have my patients, you know, do it several times a day while they're sick because you're just trying to rinse away the virus and the mucus before it can drip into your throat. So try to keep it up north. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of things you can do. My other counsel is just get seen. Get seen as day one. I can get you through that recording session. I can get you through that performance. But when you come to me day seven and it's kind of creeping towards a sinus infection, now you're like, I need to perform tonight. That's a lot harder for me to get you to be able to do. Right. So what I say is as soon as you feel it, rinse your nose. Sometimes you can stop it within a day or two just by rinsing away the virus. Um, the nasal steroid sprays are really good. Um, hydrating like your life depends on it. And then um, like Afrin, NyQuil, DayQuil, the things that are the decongestants, hit them even though it's not nice to try to perform while you're dry, it's better than performing while you're swollen. Uh, and so I say get seen early, get seen by somebody who knows how to handle professional voice users, but the home remedies like the sinus rinses, they do work. Yeah. What about, uh, I'm a big fan of something with Zycam, mm. which works you mm -hmm. know of course i was like well maybe it's just allergy so i didn't really do anything about it for a yeah. couple of days it's like well maybe it's a cold then again allergies can turn into a cold mm -hmm. how so allergies <laughs> will make you more susceptible to catching things because you're in this state of inflammation mm -hmm. so you have this inflamed nose and viral particles can kind of latch onto there and now they're trapped because you're not getting that same flow that you're supposed to get because you're inflamed and it's sort of like your immune system is distracted so it's distracted by trying to process dust and launching this immune response to dust. And then the, the virus comes along and it's, it's not really able to attack it head on because it's doing too many jobs at once. But the truth is you're just basically chronically inflamed. So now if you keep rinsing, if you're an allergic person, you can keep that allergic response at bay and make yourself less likely to get the, the virus on top of that. And then kind of double down if you do get sick and Rinse, rinse. I mean, have I mentioned the rinse? Yeah, yeah, a couple okay. times. Yeah. yeah, okay. Rinse. Rinse. <laughs> Unless you're one of those people who can't. I should say that because I'm giving medical advice. But there's some people for whom it goes into their ears. Yeah. Um, and if you're one of those people, sorry, the rinse isn't for you and you're just, just going to have to suck it. Yeah, that's true. Just to kind of drain it out yeah. that way. No, I Don't would not advise do that. that. Don't do that. If you're just joining us, boy, you've missed a lot already. Uh, our guest is Dr. Rena Gupta. She is an a laryngologist. See, I know I New practice. Vocab. Yep. Yeah. A laryngologist. And uh, that means she is specializes in your larynx. Did I pronounce that right? You did. Oh, good. Not larynx. Yeah, I know. Larynx. I get larynx a lot. Yeah. Remember that one from and high school. Yeah. We have a lot of questions piling up. And we got questions coming in. If you've got a question for Dr. Gupta, uh, throw it in our chat room and our chat room monitors will relay that to us. And uh, we will, and we'll answer those questions. And I think that'll probably take up a, uh, quite a while here. Some, um, some of them are asking for like a specific diagnosis. And just it, to remind you again, not going to do that. I'm not going to do Yeah, Second opinions are going to be tough in this. Right. Format. Right. But you know, we'll read them anyway. And if there's anything Rena can, you know, add, sure. I'm sure she I'm can. I'm looking so. to where I hear the voice coming from. I know you're not up there, but I, I'm not <laughs> used to this format. God? And so, yeah, I'm just looking. Yeah, that's what it voice. feels like, George yeah. slash God <laughs> speaking to me. I will answer all your questions. Yeah. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the things you hear a lot for voice actors is laryngitis. Mm. You know, and uh, I mean, and, and it's not necessarily from a cold. What, what can usually cause that? Um, smoking is a big culprit. Um, pollution. So if and allergies. All laryngitis means is inflammation. That's the itis part of the larynx, right? So anything reflux laryngitis, allergic laryngitis, inhalational laryngitis, um, those are probably the commonest causes. And it's just because the larynx is on the way for mucus and for mm. refluxate. So, mm. What about stress? 
Stress. Um, what happens when we're stressed, especially for professional voice users, is we tend to manifest our stress in the muscles around our throat. So while you're not going to get inflammation from stress, a lot of the times the voice stops working because we're over gripping and we're really tight. So it's sort of like the, um, the picture with like the really tight shoulder muscles, right? And you need to kind of work it out. So there are stretches of the larynx and there's actually a whole manual therapy that I'll do in a lot of my patients and I'll have them lie down and for 45 minutes I'm working on just these ligaments and these um, the muscles that are around the larynx to try to release them so that that I kind of think of it like a slinky so that the slinky can can bend and flow again because mm-hmm. the ligaments will get tight when we get stressed. Other people manifest their stress other ways. So people will get ulcers in their stomach or knots in their shoulder, but voice users tend to go right where they need it the most. What can we as voice actors do to prevent these problems? And what can we do to strengthen our voice and and make it there when we need it? Yeah. Um, That's a complex question. All right. Well, take it one piece at a time. He's like, okay, you can do this. You can do do this. Okay. So what I would say first and foremost is making the relationships you need before you need them. So I'm a big advocate of vocal coaching and sort of having an outside set of ears to assess. I mean, I think in your first segment, you talked about how sophisticated our ability to listen is, right? You're getting these sound samples through your website and you're saying you can tell how big a room is, right? So it tells you the ear is a very sophisticated instrument. So when you have somebody listening to you and they're saying, you know, things sound a little funny, trust that and pay attention and listen and get seen. I think people tend to come to me for crisis management. And that's the other big mistake that I find is that I can't fix you in a day. You know, if you took six months to develop a problem, give me some time to get you better. Don't give me the minute that you have that recording. Right. So establishing care with somebody who is a laryngologist, who is specialized in voice before you need it, allows us to get a nice clean baseline and then compare any future issues you have against it. And then there's the basic stuff. Learn about how your instrument works so that you know how to use it. Um, constantly train it. Be you know cognizant of how medical problems affect your voice because almost all of them do in some way. Yeah, and, and take care of those. Too. Yeah, take yeah. care of those medical problems and partner with your laryngologist to say, hey, look, I have depression and I'm going to be on this medication. Are there any vocal side effects to this medication? And how can I negotiate that? You know, I'm not going to take you off your antidepressant, but there might be other things that we can do that help you strike that balance and. I think that where we run into trouble with professional voice users is that it's always crisis management. It's never, okay, let me be um, preventative about it. Let me kind of figure out what I might need to do to prevent myself from having an issue. I get too much on the other side, you know, when it's now I have a crisis and I need to figure out the solution. But treat it like any other athlete treats their body part that's related to their sport, you know, is get it fine-tuned, get it maintained, get it evaluated constantly, and you won't run into any issues. And warm it up. Warm it up. Cool it down. Tell us us a little bit about that that process, about how do you warm up your voice? Because I've seen half-hour routines, and I've I've just sung the scales some mornings, and that seems to help. Yeah, I'm going to tell you that that's out of my bailiwick. And so whatever I tell you is going to be made up. Okay. And probably unreliable, but that's where you want exactly we speak to getting a good vocal coach or getting someone to create a warm up for you. I think a lot of voiceover people should take singing lessons. If for no other reason than you start to become a a scientist of your own voice and what can you do at the extremes and what are your extremes? And then now when you're warming up, you're task testing. You're figuring out, okay, am I still able to do the full range that I've always been able to do? And when you start missing notes off the top, I get it. You're not singing every day, right, right, for a career. But when you start to miss a note off the top, now you're testing the extremes and you're catching an issue when it's step one instead of when it's affecting your speaking voice, which might be step three or step four. So the warm up and the cool down, you know, I can't speak to, but having one and having a vocal coach and maybe even a singing coach might be a nice way to establish that um, routine for yourself. All right. One trick I will tell you, though, if I may jump in, please, um, and I don't allow my patients or people to Google often because I think only bad things happen when you Google medical things. (laughs) This happens in Um, the voiceover business, too. Oh, gosh. Googling medical. Don't don't crowdsource your throat. No, please don't. Please don't. Um, But straw phonation has been time tested, a really valuable technique for optimal vocal fold closure. So you guys are in sessions for a really, really long time. And what will happen is you'll start to fatigue 
and you'll start to kick in these compensatory muscles to do the job, right? Because the primary movers are exhausted. And that will result in a lot of inaccurate closure patterns and sort of suboptimal inefficient use patterns. So there's a technique, and it's been really popularized by this vocal scientist, Ingo Tietze, um, which is spelled T-I-T-Z-E. And he has sort of been a pioneer in the field of vocology, which is the study of sort of the, um, the use of voice, and it's the marriage of the art and the science in a way. And so what you do is you use this like coffee stir size straw and you just do different pitch glides and what I call revving the engine like through this little straw and the resistance that it provides gives you back pressure onto your vocal folds to optimize closure. So if you're in the middle of a three hour session, doing that every 30 to 60 minutes can give you a really nice reset. It's sort of like the runner who stretches their hamstrings before each race. Um, so I will allow you to Google that. Um, and Tietze's videos on it are really a beautiful way to um, understand how it works, why it works, and what to do. And that would be as far as I'm going to dip my toes out of the medical world into like speech pathology and right. vocal technique. Because um, otherwise, yeah, I, I start sounding dumb. And I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah. All righty. Once again, we're talking with Dr. Rena Gupta from Osborne Head and Neck Institute here in Los Angeles. Talking about vocal health, again, if you've got a question for her, put it in our chat room. And I know they're probably starting to pile up already. So we're going to take a break, and uh, we'll be right back with Dr. Gupta right after these messages. Skittles, taste the rainbow. She has fought for those who don't have a voice. The National Zoo. <laughs> because sometimes you just need to stroke a llama. Instagram. Download it and start embarrassing your teenagers today. Resolve spot and stain. Because the dog's gonna drag his butt on the carpet. He just is. $400 million. That's what the mayor wants you to pay for a new basketball stadium. Chickens were made to be fried. Sorry, buddy. KFC. Engage the droid army with this Lego Star Wars Republic fighter tank. <laughs> what? You've never seen a girl kill a troll? GameStop. Hey, I'm the cat meme guy. Come on, you know you love cat memes. Instagram, what's your thing? Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. Over $100. Now, this applies to just items on the homepage which is everything except the great bundle packages they offer at voiceoveressentials.com. Just submit the promo code VOBS, VOBS, in the shopping cart, and the discount will immediately display when the order is over $100. Now, speaking of bundles, if anyone would like a great deal on a microphone made specifically for voiceover, you can get their VO1A microphone, the Vox Pop Stop Pop Filter, and a MicPort Pro USB interface for $50 off their normal prices. You can check that out by going to the site voiceoveressentials.com and clicking on the On Sale menu item at the top of the page. It's a bundle with an already great discount. The VOBS promo does not apply to it. voiceoveressentials.com, the place for everything voiceover. <clears throat> And we're back here on VoiceOver Body Shop. But George, you're here. <laughs> How'd you do that? Hey. <laughs> so we got lots of questions. Fire away. Yeah, I'm going to give Dan a vocal rest and go through some of these Thank real you. quickly. A few of them were emailed in before the show, actually. And uh, again, some of these are asking for diagnoses, but let's, let's see what Dr. Gupta has to say. First from Paul Parisi. He says, I'm a voice actor in the New York City area, and I was diagnosed with stage four papillary thyroid cancer. I had surgery this past July. The surgeon took out my thyroid and found it spread to my chest. The surgeon told me it would take about a year before I could go back to voice acting, but I've been itching to get back to work. My voice seems better, but it gets raspy if I talk too long. I went to a throat doctor before my operation, and he said that it shouldn't interfere with my acting. I just want your opinion when I should be okay to voice act again. Thanks for any information you can give me. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm sorry for the health issue. That's got to be extremely stressful and difficult to go through. And to be perfectly frank, that alone, the stress of that is alone enough of a reason to have a voice issue. Um, 
it is really hard. It's kind of what we were alluding to before. It's hard for me to know when you're going to be safe without having a, a much more complete picture, despite the detail you provided. Um, I definitely rely on the sound of your voice and the exam and the strobe and everything to really be able to clear a patient for voice use. Now, there are going to be more questions like this, and um, I understand why and where they're coming from. So I will say that I do a lot of remote consultations. If you look through um, my website, voicedoctorla.com, there is a sort of request a remote consultation, and you can always put information through there. I love to have videos accompany those questions because, again, that allows me to really analyze your particular case and give you help rather than just saying, you know, oh, it seems like it should be fine. Um, thyroids and voices are very intimately connected. So <clears throat> stage four definitely has a lot of implications to it. And I would I would really want to take a look at the details before being able to offer you an opinion. I'm sorry. It sounds fair enough. I mean, you have to give accurate information based on the enough data, you know? Yeah. Um, Ms. Tanner, or Mrs. Tanner says, what are your suggestions for those of us with allergies, but who are also usually mouth breathers? I can't remember if I mentioned the sinus rinse. <laughs> sinus yes, rinse. Yes, you yeah. talk about rinsing, like yeah. the neti pot yeah. type. Rinse, thing. rinse, rinse. So what you're basically trying to do is wash those allergic particles out of your nose. So the reason we become mouth breathers, if we do, is that over time with uncontrolled allergies, there's structures in your nose called turbinates. So they're long, they're kind of like, almost think of them like a finger and they go front to back in your nose. And their job is to humidify the air that we breathe, to warm it up, to filter it, and to sort of be your body's initial line of defense so that by the time that air gets into your lungs, it's in good shape basically to be breathed. But because of that, they react, right? So you get an allergen, it goes in, it latches onto that turbinate and the turbinate will swell. And as it swells, it takes up more and more space in your nose until your nose becomes too tight a space through which you can't breathe. I got lost verbally there. I'm sorry. It can't happens. breathe through your nose anymore. <laughs> and so you go to the path of least resistance, which is your mouth, which is drying because you don't have those nice humidifying turbinates in there. So rinsing will help to stop the process from getting worse. But if you're already mouth breathing, it kind of sounds like your turbinates have hit that point where you might need more. And it might be a steroid nasal spray. It might even be a procedure. And, you know, one of my things is I get that surgery is scary. Procedures are scary. But usually in cases like what you're describing, the benefits far outweigh the costs because it's really important for your general body health to breathe through your nose. So nobody wants to need a procedure, but you want a procedure more than you want to mouth breathe. So managing your allergies is really important for vocal health, for general health. And so I would start with the rinse. If it doesn't cut it, see an ENT who will be able to assess your nose. And if it's affecting your voice, see a laryngologist who should be able to dial back and take a look at your nose. Since we're talking about dry mouth, uh, Deidre Holly has about dry mouth due to medication. Medication. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you try to offset that? That's a really difficult problem, and it's not so uncommon. Um, pretty much all the mood meds, you know, all the antidepressants, antipsychotics do that. Um, Retin-A is another really common culprit. And then a lot, I mean, even thyroid medication, blood pressure medication can do it. And there are sometimes substitutes that you can make that are equally effective for your primary problem, but without as much of that side effect. It's a rare case where you can really substitute out that side effect. And so unfortunately, you're just sort of caught with saying, I am somewhat encumbered by this dryness. And you're going to probably want to take more rests, be really aggressive about hydration. Those lozenges that are hydrating and the entertainer's secret is another little thing that you can do throughout because it will moisturize that vocal tract. But um, know that basically you're a little bit more fragile and treat your body as such and just take more breaks and hydrate, hydrate. Like pee pale is basically the, the mantra. Hmm. There's some really interesting questions in here. I mean, they're, they're, they get into some holistic kind of stuff. Um, okay. This one from Glenn Moore says, can poor and slumped neck and or pot bad back posture. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> sit up. What now? <laughs> uh, can it affect your sinus drain down the throat and specifically oh, to the vocal cords? That's not where I thought you were going. So I can slump again. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so posture does affect vocal production because it is related to how you're using your breath and Bad posture is just not good anyway, but 
in terms of post nasal drip, your posture does not affect your inside flow. So in the end, you can be like this and it'll still go down the back. So it will not affect post nasal drip. If you have it, you manage it non posturally. Great. There you go. Great answer. Thank you. Fred North, uh, he's in Louisville, Kentucky, and among the worst places for allergies. And he lives on antihistamines, mm -hmm. nasal rinses, nasal steroids, decongestants, and local honey. LA is pretty oh. bad for allergies, yeah. too. It's Everywhere is the worst. Pretty bad right now. Yeah. <laughs> he says, and you may have already answered this with some of your suggestions, but he says, Am I missing anything short of voodoo? <laughs> um, the only thing I can think of, because it sounds like you tapped a lot, um, is immunotherapy. And so there's two forms of immunotherapy for allergies. And what you're basically doing is training your body to be less sensitive. And so there's allergy shots, which a lot of people have heard of. And then there's what we call sublingual immunotherapy, which are the same formulation as those shots, but you're putting them in drops under your tongue. So it's nice. You avoid the trip to the doctor's office. You avoid the shot. And they're equally effective, studies have shown. And so what you might try to do, is it George, mm -hmm. um, is look into immunotherapy. You might also want to look into those turbinates because sometimes what happens is the medications are less effective, like the nasal sprays and stuff, because the turbinates have gotten so swollen that the spray can't get back to the back of your nose. And so you're continually having that allergic response further on in your nose because you spray it and it hits the front of your nose and it just drops. It can't progress, I guess. So I would say having a really more sophisticated evaluation of your nose is probably going to be 50% of the battle. And then considering immunotherapy, um, there are other sprays. We tend to rely on the, the cheaper ones like Flonase, Fluticasone, Nasonex, which are um, liquid sprays. But increasingly I'm prescribing for my patient an aerosolized steroid nasal spray because air can get through no matter what, right? So the liquid will not really have that ability to propel, but there are almost like asthma inhalers for your nose, which will shoot straight back there. And we, I put a scope in the nose and sprayed the spray and watched it get all the way into the back and then sprayed the liquid and see nothing. So I know there's a difference. The question is, have you hit that point where even that won't work, in which case you're considering having your turbinates reduced and you're considering the immunotherapy. So those are sort of like our, um, the surgery is a last resort, obviously, but the immunotherapy should be strongly considered early on in the process because you will lower your body's overall inflammatory state if you can get your body to be less allergic. And um, I'm a customer myself of this system, and it works. Um, I almost got rid of my dust allergy just through immunotherapy alone. Mm. So, yeah. In interesting. What about, you know, the, because there's alternative forms of medicine. There's mm -hmm. holistic stuff and Chinese medicine. And I've seen some pretty amazing things in my day, uh, yeah. you know, where it's like, you know, a, an acupuncturist will say, make tea out of this. And it works. Okay. God only knows what's in that yeah. tea, but uh, have you had any experience with that? Or I'm going to plead the fifth okay. because I don't know yeah. um, and I don't poo-poo anything because right. you just said it, right? It worked. Right. So if it worked, rock on, you know, as long as you're not getting really significant side effects or anything like that. I think of immunotherapy as pretty darn holistic because it's the natural things that you're allergic to, you're just putting it under your tongue. So they actually even sell like a form of it at Whole Foods and things like that. So that's about as natural as I can allow myself to get just because I haven't studied the Eastern medicine enough. But I've certainly heard those stories too. And I'm the last to say stop because I don't know it. Right. If it works, yeah. who cares? You don't need me then. Yeah. Question from Joy, ba Joy Baker. Yeah. Joy. Um, can you do anything to help people improve their vocal stamina mm -hmm. and help this kind of coaching or therapy over Skype for people in the middle of nowhere. And she says, sorry for yelling. I wasn't sure. <laughs> the vast cornfields. You wanted to emphasize the nowhere part. Yeah. Okay. Um, stamina. So stamina is multifactorial. So number one, you want to make sure that you don't have any injury to the cords that's preventing you from being efficient, right? So that wear and tear that we were talking about, the biggest problem is that it cuts down efficiency because you need really easy bounce off vocal folds for them to be efficient and efficiency leads to duration of use. Um, there probably are a bunch of vocal coaches who Skype and I would actually say you could probably point people to that better than I could. Um, but you know, again, even like a good singing coach, when you start to plug into how your instrument works, 
you can extrapolate those same skills to voiceover. So, um, you know, I couldn't necessarily endorse anybody specifically, but to say that technology is your friend and finding remote care should really not be that hard these days. Getting a laryngologist is probably going to be difficult, but even if you make one vacation a year be in a place where there's a laryngologist, that's still about all you would need to say, I got diagnosis and I got maintenance now. So I would consider that as, you know, it's kind of a lame vacation in some ways, but build in, you know, a trip to Disney at the same time. And that's a win. I prefer universal, but um, yeah, I've not been to either. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Here all this time you haven't been I to know, universal. I know. I can't bring myself to do it. Oh. The lines. I can't do lines. I, you don't like crowds. I don't like crowds. Oh, okay. No, this don't is about as much universal. as I can handle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes. Uh, let, let me get, let me ask JV Martin's qu- question here. He says, uh, he says, it takes my voice a long time to wake up in the morning, and it's only getting worse as I get older. <laughs> it happens, JV. Trust me. Uh, on days that I'm recording for a client on another continent who wants me to start really early, what do you consider the most effective, safest, and quickest way to get rid of the fogginess and be mic ready? Mm-hmm. So, again, it's the same answer, right? It comes down to figuring out why are you foggy. There's going to be some element that we all take a minute to warm up, right? Nobody's expecting you to jump out of bed and run your fastest mile time. But usually for people who um, are using their voices and they're finding that grogginess in the morning, it's a little bit of post-nasal drip or reflux, right? Because you've been horizontal for the entire night. So number one, what I would say is rinse your nose the night before said performance or said, said recording. And even try a little bit of steroid nasal spray to see if you can stop that drip but also not eating within a few hours of going to bed that night. So nothing just figure like within three hours of going to bed might inhibit some of that reflux over the course of the night. And you might institute that protocol for a few nights before that recording session. You might find that morning voice is less in severity and takes less time to warm up out. So then you might try some straw stuff and some whatever warm up you've figured out for yourself. But usually morning voice happens because of a combination of drip from above and reflux from below. So if you coach yourself through that for about a week, you can probably find yourself way more reliable in the morning. Hmm. All right. Question from John C. George. Yes. uh, Question uh, from John C. Question on the throat. I was sore this week and I tried a tiny drop of basic castor type oil spread around, which made everything calm down. I wonder if that is a good or a bad idea. Hmm. Castor oil. Don't zoom in on my face. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I don't know. There's no science behind it. You feel better? I'm happy. (laughs) Good answer. It's not hurting you. It's not damaging anything. It's natural. You know, go for it, right? Um, Gary Lewis asks, why does my voice change to a raspier sound as the day goes on? Often my voice sounds better in the morning. Better in the morning? Is that what you said? That's what, that's he, what said. he said. Yeah, so that's not that uncommon. If you have um, a lot of voice use, you're just accumulating swelling over the course of the day, most likely, right? So it just take it like any other body part. You're like, okay, I wake up and you know my knees don't hurt, but then over the course of like walking around all day, I start to get a little achy, my ankles start going. So chances are you're either being exposed to something that's irritating you, right? Like you're you're eating poorly and you're getting reflux or you're getting, you know, allergies, which are less likely, more likely is it's just the the voice use is probably a little bit too much. And so you're just accumulating swelling and swelling sounds like raspiness and it'll feel more effortful and it'll be harder. So then you'll start pushing a little bit more and then swelling begets swelling. And then the next thing you know, you can't really control the rasp anymore because you're swollen beyond your ability to push through it or push past it. Oh, well, fantastic. But get checked out. Um, That's the best way to know for sure. But that'd be my guess. Sometimes also I should say minor injuries, like little pseudocysts, little polyps, as you use them, those disproportionately swell. And so you'll find yourself more hoarse at the end of the day because that little injured area has gotten worse. Right. What you, what usually causes polyps? I mean, people are always talking about vocal polyps. What usually causes that and how can you prevent that? All vocal injury is the same thing which is you get little bleeds, little what we call like micro bleeds in that layer that we were talking about earlier, that gelatinous layer. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be vocal trauma. And that can be using your voice incorrectly, using it too loud, using it too long, being sick and coughing a ton, using your voice when you're sick, you know, really pushing it. 
but basically you're talking about too much force on fragile blood vessels and whatever variables make that be too much for you is going to be an individual thing but then you get this little bleed in your vocal cords and that causes inflammation and from the inflammation you start to get polyps nodules all that kind of stuff if the voice use continues if you find that little bleed when it first happens you can prevent anything from happening but most people kind of ignore the early symptoms because it's going to sound like i sound today right like a little bit raspy a little bit swollen and you're like oh it's because i've been using my voice a lot in my case you know i'll excuse it away but this could be all you would hear from one of those little micro bleeds and now you're setting yourself up for injury in the long run so i always tell my singers and and voiceover actors one to two days of hoarseness that doesn't get better get checked out because if you have one of those bleeds we want to know sooner than later right how do you know you'd like feel a twinge or something or? you hear it Oh, you well, hear it. So too. again, like you'll hear this. Right. And so I'll say, okay, today it's because I'm really jet lagged and I haven't slept and I've been, you know, I taught this morning. So all my excuses, right? So I'll rest for the rest of the evening and I'll check in with my voice tomorrow. And if it starts to feel better and stay getting better, then I'm reassured. If it doesn't feel better or I don't feel like I have that control back, that's when I'm going to scope myself or in your case, be scoped. <laughs> You're gonna scope yourself. Well, that must who else be fun am I to gonna watch. rely on? Well, there you go. I don't <laughs> like anybody really editing my work yeah. either. So I... <laughs> exactly. So you know my pain. <laughs> okay, yeah. totally get that. Uh, question from um, Maurice Maurice A. Scott. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, there's another one from Tracy Reynolds that you basically just answered. Oh, good. Because it was about the voice getting tired throughout the day. Um, so check. You got to check two on one. Excellent. Um, Maurice A. Scott says, what are some ways to get rid of mucus in the throat that seems to have lingered for more than a week? I can't be comfortable. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Is it from an illness? I guess I can't ask you that question. But if it's like commonly, it'll be you got sick and you have all this post nasal drip that doesn't go away. It's what we call that post viral period. So you're sick for the week and then the symptoms persist for another. Um, so if that's what's going on. You'll be shocked to hear my advice is to rinse. Um, but you do. You get rid of all that inflammation. You get rid of the snot, um, you know, a nasal spray. But also figure out why are you having the mucus? Because sometimes we feel the sensation of mucus when actually you're starting to form an injury. So what we perceive as mucus is just something that is making the voice not reliable or we want to clear our throat. And I've had almost all of my injured patients say, I'm just constantly clearing my throat because... They're trying to get that clarity back, but what they're not realizing is that they're perceiving that injury and how it's disturbing the vibration. And so, again, you hit that sort of threshold of two to three days of symptoms that you can't really control. Always better to get checked out, especially if your voice is your livelihood. The, the worst thing that could happen is you come in and I'm like, oh, you're fine. You didn't really need to come in. And that's great. You know, like I would love to be able to say that more often, but usually it's okay. Well, no, you're starting to form this or you know, you have a, a problem that we need to solve. Don't ignore your body. I mean, I think that's where most vocalists get into trouble is that we sort of excuse the different symptoms that we have as like, oh, it's probably X, Y, and Z. And we really are afraid to get evaluated or you're sort of hesitant to pull the trigger because you're like, oh, it's probably nothing rather than just being reassured that it is nothing. And I, no one likes to go to the doctor. I get that. I don't, can't remember the last time I went to one, but you know, if it's what you do for a living, if my hand started shaking, you better believe I'm going to be in the doctor the next day. Right. So if this is what you do, then invest in it and, and get it checked out. You know, makes complete sense. Um, Joy Baker asks, when should we see a laryngologist? What are the warning signs that something is wrong? Well, you sort of mentioned that. Yeah. You, great you, question. You hear it. So, yep. Every year I tell all my voice users get checked out every year and get checked out. Now, if you have no problem now, Give me the luxury of a clean baseline exam and let me know what you're supposed to look like so that even a microscopic change, now I can pick up on it. Because there's a lot of variability, right, where I might ignore certain things because I've seen your baseline and I know that you were functioning with that little blip. And so I'm not going to call it when you're having symptoms. So, you know, the clean baseline is really nice. The annual check. All my patients, I say, come in when you're sick because all sickness affects the voice to some degree. So let me get it so that it doesn't affect your voice in a way that hurts you. And then within one to two days of any change in your voice, that doesn't get better with rest. Those are my three rules, basically. 
Now, the, la, during the week, I, I was talking about the session I was doing. It was a lot of shouting it was for a kid's toy commercial. So it's like, it's like this. After, and it was a two-hour session. Mm. And after about 45 minutes, I felt a little twinge in there. Mm-hmm. So when I went to the water and started drinking water, and that seemed to help a lot. And I mm-hmm. was able to get through the whole session without too much pain. Yeah. But I tend to think that this cold ended up from that. Um, it probably didn't end up from it, but probably the opposite. You were starting to get the cold. You were getting a little swollen. You're doing all this work, and now you're having to push a little bit to do the job. Yeah. So in that moment, what you do is you do what you got to do, right? You do the job. You do your straw phonation between every 30 sec- minutes that you can do it. Right. And check in the next day, right? And if your voice is still feeling off, maybe you rest for a day, and then you check in again the next day. And if it's still off, that's when you get checked out because performing when sick is when – probably 85% of my patients' injuries happen. Ah. So it's because you have to push to get a swollen instrument to do what you're asking of it. You know, men actually get a little bit more of a free pass. Like you just feel you're a little bit more injury resistant than women. Um, And that's just anatomy. And And some of us sound better when we're injured. Yeah, because you get that nice (laughs) faciness that we get fry. You know, it's not, continues to be unfair. But, um, you know, don't, don't discount what you're hearing. Right. Trust your ear, trust your voice. And if it doesn't sound like you are normal, it's usually for a reason. Um, and sometimes I don't need to do anything but reassure you like, okay, this too shall pass. But sometimes you really do need a little bit of help to get you out of the danger zone. All righty. George, you get the last question. Last question. Better be this the best. Is, this is, <laughs> well, actually, Dan, this is a, a side note. Have you mentioned your favorite nasal nasal uh, rinse? Alkalol? Somebody mentioned it earlier in one of the questions, but I've been using alkalol. You know, we use it as a vocal as a vocal rinse mm. because people get mouth clicks and stuff like that. I find I spray that in there, it's gone. Fine you know, by every, me. Everybody's trying Granny Smith apples and apples are big. Yeah, yeah. And all sorts of different things. Yeah. I found this. I'm spell that. Rinse. How do you Even spell that? A- we're, talking, we're not talking about alcohol. We're, we're talking, talking about alcohol. I think there's a bottle yeah, do out not there rinse your somewhere. nose with alcohol. A L K A L O L. You got it. You nailed it. Yeah, no alcohol. You're pro. So this is the official last question. Okay. So this is from JV Martin again. Um, I mean, it looks like a multi-parter. Is it true that whispering is harder on our vocal cords than full speaking? Yeah, that's a. I, I get. I do get asked that a lot. Um, yes and no. No answer short with me. So number one, it depends why are you whispering, right? If you have a vocal injury and you should be on vocal rest, then don't whisper. That counts as voice use, right? So if you're trying to find a way to protect your voice, then just, and there's a, these days technology, there's text to talk. There's a lot of ways to be on vocal rest and not have it be torture. Um, but in that scenario, you're definitely hurting yourself because you're supposed to be on rest. The reason that myth about whispering is worse than talking came up, I think, is partly that, is that people were whispering when they were supposed to be silent. But what can happen for some people is that you entrain muscle memory when you're whispering. And whispering is a very squeezed upper larynx posture. So we call them false vocal folds. It's squeeze. And that's how you get sound without vocal fold contact. Um, And what can happen is you can start to entrain that and your body can kind of forget how to go into a more organic voice use in the correct form. So I don't mind whispering so much if you're just trying to offload pressure on your cords and you're feeling just like a little bit tired, but you want to try to restore closure again, straw phonation, good technique um, to follow that and ask yourself why you're doing it. And if it's because you're tired, then the answer is to be silent. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, he has he has a little follow up. I let him. I let I lost. Let this one. You slip let this in. one go. Okay. He, he he had a follow up, and it was from an earlier question, so it was a little bit more detail. Um, this was regarding uh, using a certain kind of pillow, a wedge pillow, mm-hmm. keeping from lying flat. Yeah. Is that a good idea? So that's a reflux treatment. So if you know you have acid reflux, I I like to start with lifestyle modifications instead of medications because I don't like meds in general. Um, but the wedge is basically to keep you inclined so that you can't reflux into your throat. It kind of stays lower. Um, my preference is that you find out why you're refluxing. So is it something in your diet that you can eliminate? Can you not eat as late? But if you have it, despite controlling everything else, and the pillow is, again, a nice way to not need medication. 
I wouldn't do it haphazardly, meaning if you don't have reflux, sleep flat. But if you're finding that you're getting heartburn, really prolonged morning voice that doesn't respond to nasal treatment, then you might have reflux. Try the diet stuff first, and if not, go for the wedge. But don't just stuff pillows behind your neck because that does this, and you actually increase abdominal pressure. So if you're going to incline, either put Mm. something above the bedposts that are at the top of your bed or do the wedge. All righty. We're going to cut it off right there. Yeah. Yeah. Do the wedge. That was one of the most concise and well-answered a uh, volley of questions in right. a while. Go on. Yeah. Where else are you going to hear this stuff? But on our <laughs> show, you know, we try to bring you everything that's important for your your voiceover career, and nothing's more important than this. Dr. Gupta, thank you so much thank for being so with much us. For You've been great. Me. It was so much fun. And it's and you're so patient with us. Anyway, uh, George and I will be right back to wrap things up right after this. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. And we're back. And thanks again to Dr. Rena Gupta for joining us today. But you, you just can't beat that stuff, this information. You know, every time we've we've done a show like this, it, people are, like, enthralled and asking really good questions. And I love that she's really careful. Like, if she knows that she can't give proper advice, she'll she'll tell you, you know. And, and I, I feel this, I feel like a kinship in a way for what she does because she's a specialist. Right. She's a specialist specialist, right? And that's what we are. We're, like, specialists within a world of, of audio a niche, you know, and that's a really, that's, really tiny niche. <laughs> it is, it is, but it, that's why it's so important when, you know, it's when there's the right time to, to talk to somebody that really is a specialist. It's, it's really good to have that resource. Yeah. So. All right. Next week on this very show, we won't be here. We're taking a week off after how many weeks in a row have we done? My goodness. It's been, <laughs> it's, it's been a year. It's, it's been a very busy week, a couple of weeks. Uh, but on April 9th, Tim Friedlander will be here from uh, Soundbox LA. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about with Tim, but he's doing all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, April 16th, the one and only Scott Brick, the master of audiobooks, will be here. Uh, and he's always uh, great to talk to. Uh, April 23rd, we have a mystery guest, although a clue has been added. It's an agent. Wow. Well, All right, so let your... Let your mind go crazy with that one's all about. Agents are great uh, guests to have. We don't get that many of them. I know. Uh, April 30th, Kristen Lennox and daughter, or is it daughters? I don't know. I think okay. it's, she has a daughter that's a voice actor, I that's believe. That's right. Uh, and May 21st, Harry Dunn will talk about promos at the CW. Boy, they do a lot of promos over there. Uh, we'd like to thank our donors of the week. Who might those be? We got a, we got letters. We got letters. We got lots, lots of and letters. lots of letters. Uh, <laughs> Tracy H. Reynolds, who is an, I think he's one of our new. We I donate every episode kind of guys. So thank you, Tracy. Really appreciate it. Andy Andy Kaufman or Andrew Kaufman, regular for us as well as Eric Eric Aragoni. Thank you so much. Thanks, for that. Eric. Just that regular ongoing support is really appreciated. Also, Patty Gibbons is a subscriber on our PayPal uh, subscription service where you can donate a, as little as a buck a month. Um, my dad, George Whittem. Thanks, Dad. dad I, I, I call my dad, a.k.a. Google search results pages three and four. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, oh, you know what? Thanks for reminding me, Max. Shout out to my dad. I don't know if you're watching. If when you watch this, I hope you're healing up. My dad got a burn uh, in the garage with a propane heater in his leg, and it sounded pretty nasty. So, dad, I hope you're healing, 
healing up and the pain goes away soon. It's been a couple of weeks. Um, Amanda Fellows, another sustaining member, donor, and Brian Page. Um, I see these names regularly all the time, and it's just so nice to be able to read them and tell everybody that you're supporting the show. Thank you. Thomas Pinto. Oh, uh, Pinto. Shelly Avellino. We may have said those last week, but uh, thank you, everybody. We really, really, really appreciate it. All righty. Hey, if you need help with your home voiceover studio and you want to talk to George, you go to uh, georgethetech.com. That's right. And if you want to talk to Dan, go over to homevoiceoverstudio.com. All right. Now, and you've got a new podcast that you're doing, too, about for, for geeks. Yeah, it, it's released. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> it's released semi-monthly, or is that bi-monthly? Twice a month. Bi-monthly. Bi-monthly. Yeah. Uh, it's released bi-monthly, uh, <laughs> and uh, we record once a month. It's not done live. It's a traditional podcast. It's called the Pro Audio Suite, and it's four of us audio folk. Uh, it's a, it stars an Aussie VO actor, Andrew Peters, who has a radio background, background. Aussie producer, Darren Robertson, and our very, our very own source elements, uh, Robert Marshall, and myself. We geek out. I, we I also review voice talent as well. So it's not just total pure geekiness. Very cool. All righty. Uh, show logs. Hey, if you're going to watch this show later on, uh, which you're doing now because you're probably watching it later on, uh, there is the show log uh, that Jack DeGoli is taking down. I can't wait to see what he's writing for this one. Uh, talking about all the things that were talked about in the show with time code. So you can find stuff like the answer to a specific question. So, that's right above me here, I think, in our website. Just click on show logs. Uh, hey, show us your booths. Like this guy here. Let's see. This arm goes this way, that way. There. Show us your booths. <laughs> we got a lot of pictures of people in their booths. Give it a good shot so we can really see what it looks like. And I don't know whose this is, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. But uh, it's kind of fun being in other people's studios. I have to say, I've been staying. I've been corrected. It's when it's twice a month. It's semi-monthly, according to that other, person. <laughs> if it's every other month, it's bi-monthly. All righty. Hey, if you want to be in the studio for the show, like Denny Hankler's doing tonight, uh, we can. You can. You can be here live on Monday night uh, at six o'clock. Just write to us at the guys at vobs TV, and you too could be sitting right here in this very studio which is a lot smaller than it looks on TV. Uh, and let's see, we need to thank our sponsors, like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. Uh, VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VO to go, go. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And J. Michael Collins Demos. All righty. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. We do need to thank, of course, Marcy for letting us be out here in the garage. Uh, our, our producer, producer yeah. <laughs> Catherine Curridan. I was keeping the alternating thing going. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, all right. Producer uh, Catherine Curridan, who's booked uh, these fabulous guests. Yeah. Uh, Jack Daniel on chat room duty, although Matt or Hat, whatever we decide to call him, was taking it on for a little bit. Thank you for filling in. We appreciate it. Um, and our wonderful floor producer and technical director, Susan Merlino. And Jack DeGully for the show notes. And of course, Lee Penny. Just for being Lee Penny. Come visit us, Lee, for crying out loud. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. You know, my voice held out for the whole thing. It's a, not an easy business, especially on your voice. So stay tuned every week here at VoiceOver Body Shop, except next week. Although you get, you have a choice of 300, over 300 episodes that you could watch next week if you, if you, you know, you're feeling like you left, you're left out. Uh, so, uh, Stay tuned every week here at VoiceOver Body Shop. We're here at 6 o'clock every Monday night. And uh, that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or VOBS. Yeah. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>